I think it's a celebration of everything that's happened in the last year, electing two lesbians to the Board of Supervisors, Amanda, the Board of Education, passing AB1, um, AB 101 this week off the assembly floor. It's just a celebration, a culmination of everything that our community has to be proud of in the last year. I was going to ask about that, particularly they just announced the passing of right. the gay rights bill mm -hmm. by the assembly. Does that put particularly special emphasis on tonight? Sure, I mean, I think it signals an inevitable progression toward our full equality in, in California, and it's just something that we have more to be proud of this week. Welcome, everyone, to the um, AB 101 All the Rage panel. We're excited to have everyone here. I'm Lauren Thomas, and I will disclose right up front I was not at the AB 101 riots. Um, and I made that really clear when I was invited to uh, moderate this panel that as long as it was okay that I wasn't there. I was, however, in Washington, D.C. with a group of activists from California, and we did manage to burn the California flag in front of the California <laughs> So I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank Gerard Koskovich, who in his ongoing and essential role as the keeper of our history um, has put together this panel. It's a full multimedia panel. Um, we started with the film clip. You're going to see more film, and we're going to get some uh, really amazing music inspired by this as well. Um, so. What we're talking about, the AB 101 veto riot, how many folks in the room were at this? Excellent. Um, so it happened uh, 20 years ago, and in San Francisco in particular at the State Building, caused by uh, then-Governor Pete Wilson's veto of a bill, Assembly Bill 101, that was um, a non-discrimination bill, an LGBT, LGBT. I will limit that, uh, just a non-discrimination <laughs> bill. Um, and just to put it into context a little bit, in 1991, we were um, a good 10 years into the AIDS epidemic here in San Francisco, here in California. We were about five years into the heart of AIDS activism, um, and we had a set of people who had been mounting uh, civil disobedience and other forms of direct action for a while. P. Wilson um, was that rarest of things now, a moderate pro-choice Republican, um, and uh, AB 101 was this uh, bill um, preventing discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation that, as you saw in this clip, passed through the legislature, and in fact, Pete Wilson had uh, promised that he would sign it. Um, and part of what happened was that after it passed the legislature, the religious right in California, the Traditional Values Coalition, mobilized uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people to write in, and it changed Pete Wilson's mind, and um, he vetoed it. So that is sort of the context that set off all of these um, uh, riots. And uh, it's, I think, probably worth saying as well, to put this into context, that the national version of a non-discrimination bill has not yet been passed um, by Congress nor signed by our president, and in some part because our national organizations couldn't quite manage to make the case to include gender identity in it, which is... I have my opinions about that, but um, <laughs> we'll probably get to that uh, later in the conversation. Um, so that's the context in which this happened, and now we're going to show a short film with some uh, footage of this. Yes, and directed by Steve. Yes, and directed by Steve, who's going to talk a little bit more about why he made this film. When we 
first got the uh, the notation, it, it was and still is incredibly complex. The idea that almost chaotic events have a rhythm that can be musically notated is a big part of all the rage. Bob's piece is actually very moving for me. Every time I hear All the Rage, it reminds me very vividly of what that night was like. Yeah, the Vito riot on September 30th, 1991, was part of a long series of, of activist events in San Francisco that were sparked initially by the AIDS crisis which hit San Francisco very hard. There have been more than 18,000 people who've died uh, who were San Francisco residents as of today. Uh, and at that time, we were still four years away from the so-called cocktail, the, the effective pharmaceutical treatments that changed AIDS from a death sentence into a manageable chronic condition. There also was, concomitantly, a huge upwelling of community activism and community interaction, of creativity, uh, politically, culturally, to try to respond to this crisis. It also was a period of time in which we saw the San Francisco Police Department engaging in a series of crackdowns in 1989. In October, there was a small ACT UP protest. The SFPD sent half of all the police officers on duty that evening to close down the Castro for about three hours to declare the entire neighborhood an unlawful assembly, uh, crack heads, lock people in businesses and houses. You are subject to arrest on the sidewalk or in the street. This is not over. You're subject to arrest. Get back inside there. Do not walk behind you. Orders a couple of hundred cops at a peaceful demonstration. We're not going to forget what happened tonight. After that, relations between the police and uh, and militant activists were quite tense. There was a piece of legislation that would have banned housing discrimination against gays and lesbians that the governor of California had promised to sign during his electoral campaign. Those of us on the militant activist side of things didn't have any faith at all in electoral politics and certainly not in a Republican governor. So we were 99% sure that he was going to veto this bill and the community wasn't planning anything to react to that. So uh, my friend Bob Smith and I were sitting at Cafe Floor and said, well, we ought to just produce a flyer that says after the governor makes his decision, come to the Castro for a celebration or a protest. We had a truck rented with sound system to produce a stage on the Castro. We did not get any police permits. We did this all in classic militant activist form. Uh, there were about eight to 10,000 people who showed up. Taking the temperature of the crowd, it was clearly a very, very angry group of people. And of course, the former police chief who was running for mayor showed up to posture for votes, and uh, a group of, of militants chased him out of the neighborhood. He ran, he fled for his life, and lost his shoe. So ultimately then, that group, we announced that we would be marching to the Old State Building downtown. We were not inciting anyone to go break windows and light a building on fire, but we were afraid that they were going to, and we wanted to channel that towards a building that would be an appropriate target. Well, a building owned by the state of California is an appropriate target when the state of California misbehaves, uh, whereas some local shopkeeper's corner store would not be an appropriate target. Uh, so if that anger had to be unleashed, it was unleashed in the right place. And it was actually quite moving going there. When the crowd got there, the police clearly had not expected this to happen. So there was a row of about three police barricades in front of the door and a single squad of eight SFPD officers standing there watching this enormous crowd swarm down and surround them. There was no way for other cops to get in there. It was a rather frightening moment for a period of a couple of minutes, those police stood there and held their ground, and we were very worried. Were they going to open fire? What were they going to do? They clearly felt threatened. Instead, they turned tail and ran into the building and hid. That's when the crowd then surged 
forward to the building and ultimately the people at the front started breaking windows, uh, smashed out all of the entry windows and many of the other windows on the building and lit one corner of the building on fire. Uh, I was not part of that activity. I was in the back uh, because I was already, how to put it, well known to the SFPD and could not be taking part in any activities that would get me in that kind of trouble. Uh, and I was taking notes as a legal observer to, to make sure that, that, um, that we would uh, keep track of what the police were doing. At the time of the riot, a lot of electoral politics, gay activists in town, were very angry and very upset because they felt that we had ruined any chance of this bill ever passing. That, of course, no governor would ever sign it after gays had misbehaved so terribly and had demonstrated that we didn't deserve our rights. Uh, well, that's not how it worked out, in fact. The next year, AB 101 was passed again by the state legislature and the governor signed it, leading many of us, of us in town to go around that week saying, it's right to riot. That ultimately queer people are not to be toyed with, that we can be pushed beyond a breaking point. There was a lot of despair ultimately that we weren't saving our friends' lives, that we weren't bringing about the change that we expected to bring about, uh, that 70% of the country still thought it was okay that we should be denied our jobs and denied places to live and uh, treated to, to hate crimes and generally excluded and ignored as our community was dying. The veto riot emerged out of that long period of cultural ferment. based in the Mission District. <laughs> um, both were members of ACT UP back in the day. And with that, Leo. I sort of want to go over a few things that um, were mentioned in the film. Um, like Gerard said, um, the idea of a demo came out of a conversation at Cafe Floor. At the time, Cafe Floor was really, it was our sort of our second headquarters when it came to um, ACT UP demonstrations. Um, over coffee, they only shoot coffee back there. Um, <laughs> we'd uh, come up with ideas, but this was the day before the 1991 Folsom Street Fair, and Bob Smith and Gerard Kostovich were discussing the fact that no one seemed to be prepared for a possible veto of AB 101. As you saw from the clip in the beginning, there was an interview with, with the, um, the boy who thought, um, you know, it was coming up, it was inevitable. Pete Wilson ran on a campaign of, yes, I will pass um, AB 101. So out of that conversation between Bob and Gerard, they came up with flyers um, that essentially said, you know, victory, victory celebration or, or veto riot, um, Pete Wilson, you decide. And a, sort of another little like network of things that we, we had back then is we tend to have friends who worked in coffee shops so we could get flyers made very quickly um, and within hours and, and overnight. So after these flyers were made, um, Bob and, and some friends, and I don't remember who, um, unfortunately, passed the flyers out at the Folsom Street Fair. And then it was either that night or the next, um, a bunch of us met to discuss the logistics of, of the demonstration. It wasn't a, a act of demonstration, but it was a lot of us who had been in act up, um, or were in act up actually, and we just met in in a living room and talked about what we wanted to do, um, you know, the demonstration. I don't think we discussed speakers at the time, but one thing that that was decided is like um, the movie mentioned, it was an election time, 
and there was a lot of heavy, heavy campaigning happening. So we wanted to keep the theme of demo a community response, and because of that, we didn't want to have any elected officials speak at the demonstration or um, anybody who was running for office. I, God, I can't remember. I think it may have even been only a week we, we had been um, discussing it, and then the veto happened. So, let's see, the, the veto happened on a Sunday night, and then um, the next morning there was a meeting held at the Cove Cafe, which I don't think exists. I don't come into the Castro that much, so, but I, I don't think I saw it walking up. Um, it's still, it's still, is it? Okay. It's still it's still, okay. So, members of that organizing committee met, and also at this time, members of the mainstream queer organizations wanted to take part and be a part of this and have a hand in it. Um, like the Harvey Milk Democratic Club, um, Alice Topus, and also Legata, which was um, Les Lesbians Lesbians of African American, of African -American descent. descent, which actually was an organization that grew out of the Milk Club because the president at the time essentially pissed off the black folk and they formed their own organization. Um, so out of that meeting, of course, the demo clubs wanted to push a little bit more of campaigning type of things. This is hearsay, because I wasn't there, unfortunately, I had to work. But they, of course, wanted to push into a more campaigning type of thing. They were democratic clubs. That's what they do. Um, but our ground was held that, again, no elected officials and no one campaigning for an office. The one thing the Dental Clubs did do that we appreciated was um, providing a flatbed truck for a stage and also a sound system. So that night, people gathered for the, for the rally portion of the demo in the Castro. We had a group of speakers, and I, I just honestly don't remember anybody who spoke, unfortunately. <laughs> it's, as the time's gone on, things are getting a little fuzzy. But um, I do remember that um, some of the demo clubs wanted to change the speakers at the time. And I know I got into an argument with um, someone from Legato who wanted to have a Latino lesbian speaker. Um, but of course, I don't remember who exactly it was, but it was someone who was tied to someone who was in office. So I wasn't having it. And I also don't, as Latino like being preached to about Latino representation. So, um, another really vivid memory I have, and this is my favorite like memory of the organization, or of the, of the demonstration, is Carol Migden, who I think was a supervisor at the time, um, was at the front of the stage trying to get the attention of Bob Smith, who was, model, was um, I guess, MC, you could say. Um, she was just at the front of the stage trying to get his attention just really badly, and he was doing his best to ignore her. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at one point, she came to the side of the stage, and um, she essentially demanded she be allowed to speak. And we told her, you know, this, again, was a community response, and we weren't having elected officials speak, and we appreciated if she'd respect our process. And she essentially barked at us, I was elected by this community. Um, <laughs> you know, and um, she, Gerard, very calmly, let me know, well, you were elected to serve the community, not for the community to serve you. <laughs> She was an elected official. She stood at the side of the side of the stage, just fucking glaring at everybody. <laughs> so, so anyways, after the speeches happened, um, we marched to the new state building. We announced we're marching to the new state building, which we did. Um, overnight, someone had paint bombed the state seal. <laughs> That's part of the uh, the uh, um, new state building. And the new, the new state building actually was a little, a lot more, um, had a lot more police protection because again, I think, I think it may have been announced that we were marching there previously. So that's, that's where the police were. Um, they held their ground and um, 
And you know, it was known we were going to, well, those who had organized, known we were going to march to the old state building. Um, we just didn't let the demo club people know. And we um, don't remember who sort of whispered into um, Eric Rofus, um, the late Eric Rofus, who I, I don't remember which organization he was in, but he's, um, he's a historian as, as time went on. That, you know, let's take the mark, you know, nothing was going to happen here, let's take it to the old state building. So um, he had his bullhorn and announced, you know, let's go to the old state building, which we did, which was just a few blocks away from the new um, state building. And for the longest time, Eric uh, blamed himself for the, for the uh, riot happening in front of the old state building, but. Um, and that's, that's that. Um, actually, at the new state building, I do, you saw an image of, up there of um, Bobby Smith, Tommy Gabone, and um, Marty Mulkey burning the California flag. So, some things did happen at, at the new state building, but not to the extent that happened at the, at the old state building. Um, we got to the old state building. Again, it, was, it wasn't um, heavily protected, and the crowd that was there, um, started throwing things, the barricades through the windows. The, the funny thing to me, or maybe, well it's to me funny, is that the people who, a lot of the people who actually did the damage were demo club members. I think the expectation was, you know, that the active members would be more violent, when, even though we were like non-violent civil disobedience. But those who threw the barricades again were demo, a lot of demo club members. Um, one of them being the president of the Harvard Milk Club <laughs> at the time. Um, and uh, things escalated. No arrests happened that night. And, and I think part of that, aside from the fact that Lee Militello, I think, was going around videotaping people, um, uh, Lee Militello was like the, the liaison. Yeah, the, the, the SFPD liaison. liaison to the LGBT community. Police yeah. officer, yeah. yeah. Lee Miller sell out is what we used yeah. to call her. Um, uh, I, think, I think part of why the police also held back, it, it was actually a year since the October 6th um, shutdown of the Castro, and I think they were a little afraid uh, of, that, of that also. Um, and they held back, although when the Rodney King demonstrations happened, probably like, what, six, six months later, six months later they, they weren't as holding back. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyways, that's, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. So, yeah, I, that, that, and you know, pretty much summed up the whole sort of sequence of events, and I'm speaking very much as a, you know, attendee and participant and witness to the events of that night as opposed to somebody who was involved in the pre-planning. Um, I was certainly, you know, very involved in ACT UP at that time, but I was not part of the planning of this particular action, but I was certainly there, and, you know, sort of reflecting back on it 20 years when I was asked to come here, there, you know, a lot of things came to mind. One of the things that we talked about when we were planning this panel was, you know, how did we do all this without the internet? <laughs> we had no cell phones, we had no email, we had no Facebook, we had, you know, all this stuff just kind of got planned like Guido said, at the cafe floor. And, you know, I was thinking like, we love the cafe floor. Um, and I was thinking like, you know, did we have phone trees? Like, how did phone trees work? You're supposed to call five numbers and then they would call five other numbers. But I don't even remember being that formal. It was really just kind of word of mouth, and you just kind of told your roommates, and they told their friends, and they just everybody lived in the neighborhood, and everybody kind of worked with each other, and you know it was all very much on the fly, and that's kind of amazing to me to look back now, and you know just think how different things are 20 years later. Um, but the other thing that really so I started thinking about when I was reflecting back on this night was why was this the night that we arrived? You know, we were angry all the time, <laughs> and you know, and and this, you know, we this bill was certainly on our radar, but it was 
you know, I, I doubt if we would have put it in our top five list of priorities if somebody had asked us to list them. I mean, the war had just happened and all those demos had just happened. It was the absolute height of people getting sick and dying. Um, you know, and there were so many other things going on. And, you know, I know there were people who study mob psychology and why crowds behave the way they do. And, I, you know, sort of be interested in that aspect of it. But just from our perspective as a community, why was this the night that we broke things and things were lit on fire? And, um, you know, what was it about this? If, was it really about it being this particular bill? I mean, it, you know, obviously, you know, for, for those of us who were mostly involved as ACT UP people, this was not an AIDS issue per se. But in our minds, you know, homophobia and antiphobia were the same thing. And it was the same enemies that we were fighting, and, you know, ACT UP was often present at gay rights demonstrations that didn't have anything specifically to do with HIV, just because, you know, we saw it all as so intertwined. But this was also when Queer Nation was really big, and so there were kind of these twin groups that did a lot of stuff together, but also kind of had these different agendas and different styles, and... You know, this was just kind of at a very interesting, and there were also, you know, because of, um, you know, the Sixth International Conference on AIDS had happened the previous year in San Francisco, and that brought huge numbers of new people to the AIDS movement, and then Queer Nation also brought lots of new people, and so I think part of what was going on was this was the community's growing pains and sort of figuring out how to move forward, and that was part of it, but... Um, I still think it's interesting that of all the things that we were angry about and of all the times we had big demonstrations that this was the one that, you know, unfolded the way it did. Um, and, you know, as somebody who had been to a lot of demonstrations, I mean, there are things about that night that stand out in my mind. Mostly I remember seeing the fire. Um, I, I, I was not close enough to where the glass was being broken that I really have a vivid memory of that, but I have very vivid memories of seeing those flames go up. Um, you know, and I... Been in a lot of demonstrations at this point in my life, and I've been arrested many times. And you know, this was certainly not the biggest demonstration I'd ever been to. It was certainly not the scariest demonstration I've ever been to. I've been in other crowds that were much uglier, in places where the tension with the police was a lot worse, where things didn't go off the way they did. Nobody lit things on fire. Nobody broke things. And you know, and we used a lot of this rhetoric about riots. I mean, we always were saying the word riot. Um, you know, and it would, you know, I, 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 when I was looking back at the articles from the time, that, that there was a chant that night which was gay rights or gay rights, and I had completely forgotten about that. Um, and I also remember that there was a, does anyone remember the chant, hey cops, just try it, remember Stonewall was a riot? Um, you know, and we used to chant that to the cops all the time, right? Um, and that was... Because there was always this thing where you're demonstrating, but you're also, but in, you know, demonstrating about whatever topic you're demonstrating, but police brutality was always part of what we were demonstrating against. <laughs> really. You know, and the relationship between cops and queers, you know, had this ugly history, and so that was always kind of bubbling there beneath the surface. But in a way, I don't know if this was a right against the cops, it was really more right against the state. Yeah. You know, it didn't feel to me like it was about the police that night, particularly. Um, you know, and I just was remembering all the, you know, the the slow, the, um, the posters that said a thousand points of light and it was a Molotov cocktail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we love to use imagery like that, and yet we were not violent people, and we always said we were nonviolent organizations, and this was not part of who we were, and, you know, so it just kind of always made me think, like, why was this what went off, and so I'm not sure I have an answer exactly. I would love to hear, when we get to the discussion part of the evening, I would love to hear people's thoughts about why they think this was the night that it went off the way it did. Um, and, because uh, that just kind of is the thing that really stays with me now, is like, you know, in a way it's sort of like employment discrimination, something that's so basic. Like, really? You're not going to give us jobs? Really? You know? And that just seemed like, you know, yet again, we were being told that we were something less than human, and, you know, we had people dying all around us, and it just was one more thing, and for whatever reason, that was the night that things exploded. Um, and it was just kind of at this time, I was, you know, sort of was thinking about the way it was sort of sandwiched in between, you know, the Persian Gulf War demonstrations, which were a huge escalation, in my mind, of, you know, just how apocalyptic things were feeling at that time. You know, and we were all still in our early 20s, and our friends were talking about what are we going to do if we get drafted? You know, we were going to have to ship people to Canada. Like, what are we going to do? And that, was, and we were taking, you know, we had this big blockade of the federal building that went on for however long it went on, and 
you know, there were people smashing up in front of the stock exchange, and you know, there were other things that were happening that were kind of like that. Um, and then, of course, Rodney King just happened a few months later. So, kind of, you know, we always think we live in, you know, super turbulent times, right? But this really was. <laughs> um, so, I just, you know, what I would like to throw out to everybody when we get to the Q&A is, you know, your thoughts about why this night and what was it about this night and this issue that made this happen. Okay, thank you. Um, so, now we're going to get a somewhat different uh, perspective on it. Um, and I'm going to introduce Bob Ostertag. Uh, and the bio I have for him says, The entry on Bob Ostertag in the authoritative all-music guide begins, quote, American sampler artist Bob Ostertag embodies the sociopolitical conscience of late 20th century avant-garde music, end quote. Bob finds this flattering, if also a little embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> going to um, listen to a clip of his um, uh, piece uh, that he did with the Kronos Quartet. <laughs> Thank you. 
unusual that a demonstration, much less a riot, makes its way into a piece of music. Uh, well, let's see. Um, I had uh, recently moved to San Francisco. I wasn't a centrally involved in queer activism. I had been <clears throat> quite involved in the Central American struggles all throughout the 80s, mostly in El Salvador. So I had been in a whole other world. And it was sort of just resettling in the United States and uh, you know, re-entry into the queer world. And um, as part of my, I had been a composer before going off to El Salvador. And then uh, I'd stopped playing music for 10 years um, while I got sucked up in the Salvadoran Revolution. And um, the first piece I wrote after coming back to music was a, was a piece that I made from a recording of a young boy burying his father in El Salvador. So it's an extended piece, and the only sounds you hear are the sound of the boy talking about his father, and the sound of a shovel digging the grave, and the sound of a fly buzzing around the microphone. And I was trying to think what my next, you know, major effort would be, and the Kronos wanted me to write a piece for them. They had something about rainforests and trees that didn't really <laughs> resonate with me very much. And, um, I went to this uh, protest, and uh, as being something of an outsider there, um, I, the second I got to the Castor, I thought, this is going to be a riot. It was the first thing I thought when I got there. I thought, people are going to fuck some shit up. And, uh, people were chanting, queer riots now. And, uh, and also, everybody, you know, people used to carry whistles. Um, <laughs> And everybody had their whistles, and they were blowing their whistles, and it made this incredible noise. And I thought, this is it, I've got to record this. I went running home and got my tape recorder, and, uh, and recorded everything. And I thought, this is it, I've got to make a piece from this, this recording. So, yeah, I was right by the fire and the window and the door, because I was trying to record it all. <laughs> and, uh, unfortunately, the windows were up a little. And so in order to get the sound good, you had to get glass in your hair and things. <laughs> I remember that part. And um, uh, yeah, so I and so the the the, the piece I wrote, all, all the string parts are actually transcribed from the sounds of the riot. Everything is derived in one way or another um, from the sounds of the riot and. Uh, uh, it works in different ways in different parts of the pieces. Some parts it's very obvious how that, you know, hear a woman yell, burn it, and, you know, the viola is playing that sound, or um, you hear people smashing newspaper vending machines, or this, that. It's all transcribed. Um, there's a text. When I, when I got it all done, I thought, um, it's too, it, it's too, there's no entry way for the listeners. Just all this glass breaking, all these people screaming, all these chants, and there's no way for the listener to get inside of the sound. So I thought, why don't I have a text that somebody will read, and the text will be sort of like inside of somebody's head. You know, why would somebody be this angry? And uh, David Vonarovich, who was an artist, filmmaker, and so forth, um, very, very loved by the community at that time. Somebody who um, really caught the moment in his art room. Uh, he offered to write the text, but he was very sick. This is, you know, the time when everybody was dying. So David was very sick. So I kept waiting for the time when he would. I was going to fly out to New York, and he and I were going to work on it together. And then he never got better, and, and then he died, and so then, at the last minute, Sarah Miles uh, stepped in and sort of wrote a text that was sort of a combination of her biography and my biography and a few other people. And, uh, uh, yeah, just for the context of the time, you know, the guy who was going to write the libretto died before he could write it, the guy who read the libretto and the recording died before the CD 
was released. Um, the only gay member of the Kronos Quartet, the, the violist, uh, Hank Dunn. His partner was dying of AIDS. His partner died while we were rehearsing the piece. You know, it was just everywhere. I think that was the time. And um, so uh, I, I was happy with the piece. I thought uh, it's a really hard piece to play. It's we can't play the whole piece. But you should. I, I put all my music on the web for free download about six years ago, so if you go to my website, you can download it all. And, and you'll notice it ends with a solo of the end, viola cadenza, which I, I very much wanted. Sort of give that to Hank, you know, to have the last thing that happened in the piece be the gay member of the quartet playing by himself for his lover. Um, and it got its world premiere at Lincoln Center. We had Queer Riot Night at Lincoln Center. <laughs> uh, that was fun. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I, I actually at the riot, I thought I would interview people and use their. Mm -hmm. You know, but everybody thought I was a cop. <laughs> <laughs> I tried explaining to the first one or two people, no, actually, I'm a composer writing at string you know, as to why that was the moment, you know, I'm not one of the people who was a core organizer of the event, but I remember feeling very much like, you know, this was the one thing where we had really behaved, we had worked within the system, we had got this bill passed, the governor had promised, I remember there was a lot of, and you know, he had promised to sign it, he had run promising to sign it, he had run saying, you know, I'm a moderate Republican, I'm a big tent guy, you know, and uh, there was a, a real feeling of betrayal and that, you know, we had behaved ourselves, we'd gotten the votes, we'd done everything. And then also there was that big Christian right mobilization ticket. And it was almost like back in the days of Anita Bryant or something. It was like, no, we're not going to go through that bullshit again. Um, and I very clearly <coughs> remember the moment that the Cops turned and ran into the building, and that, that, that really was that really was the moment. You know, I read a military history book a while back. It talked about how you know, in ancient days when Romans and Greeks would go out, the armies would face each other, and they would basically make a lot of noise and bang things and posture, and they'd hardly fight until one side you know flipped out and turned around and ran, and then they would just <coughs> massacre. And I, I thought of that. <laughs> there was this like showdown between this line of cops and these protesters, and it was very tense. And the moment the cops turned and ran into the building, it was all over. Uh, so that's my Thank you. who made the film piece that you saw earlier uh, with Gerard in it. Um, Steve's a filmmaker, writer, musician, and composer <coughs> and photographer. And uh, he made this as a short um, extra piece to a much longer um, film called Reach of Resonance uh, about a number of musicians and composers. And he's currently in pre-production on his second feature film, um, part of which will be shot at the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, which is very exciting. So um, we wanted to hear from you why you made this film, how you got interested in this. Sure, it's a, it's a pretty bizarre story. Uh, first of all, let me just say it's an honor to be here amongst all of you tonight for this event. Um, I, I was really excited when Gerard asked me to be a part of this, this panel, but I was also a little bit worried because I felt that my relationship with the riot was... Uh, so peripheral that almost anything I have to say about it would just kind of derail the whole talk. Um, but I think that's because I, I 
didn't know anything, well, let me put it this way, I think I'm the only person up here tonight who experienced the riot first as a piece of music. Um, and so I just want to talk very briefly about some of the uh, unexpected cultural ripple effects that happened uh, as a result of Bob doing this piece. Uh, one of them was just simply that um, when I first heard the piece, which was about roughly 15 years after the riot happened at my friend's house here in Berkeley, um, it moved me so deeply that it was one of several experiences I had that um, provoked me to make my first documentary feature film uh, in which I contrast a number of musicians who I feel are doing work with music that's similar to what uh, Bob did with his piece All the Rage, in which they're using music as a sort of microscope to place on things uh, that people wouldn't normally connect with music, to try to expand the vocabulary we have to talk about these things through sound as opposed to through more recognizable verbal language. Um, so that hopefully we can talk about them more deeply. And music affects different parts of our brain, different aspects of our lives. And um, I was interested that he made, uh, or he created a space in which people could experience this riot as a piece of music. Uh, so anyway, I spent about seven or eight years uh, interviewing a number of other, of other musicians who were doing similar things. And uh, so there's an entire sequence in the feature film that's about this piece, All the Rage. Um, it was interesting, though, that when I was researching this riot in order to provide any kind of archival imagery of the riot itself, that I, virtually none existed. At least I certainly couldn't find any. I looked for a couple of years. Um, uh, actually, the first place I went was to the GLBT um, uh, historical archives, and no one there could find anything on it. Uh, and so I spent another couple of years looking around. Someone eventually led me back to Gerard, who happened to work there the whole time, and had actually <laughs> contributed most of the materials that the, the archives have. Uh, some of which are actually out in front by the front door. There's uh, actual shattered glass from the uh, entryway to the California State Building. There's some of the uh, protest flyers that were included in this film. Uh, Anyway, um, the reason I made the short film that you saw tonight is because um, the sequence in my feature film, even though it mentions what started this riot um, that led to this piece of music, it's primarily about uh, Bob's relationship to the riot and turning it into a piece of music. And I really wanted to um, try to create some kind of documentation of, of the history of the events that sparked the riot and how the riot itself unfolded, what would lead to something like this. So that's why I made this. Uh, this hasn't been released in any kind of official way. I figured it would just be a bonus feature for the DVD and whatever the film is released. But, but I have to thank Gerard for actually um, uh, collecting all those materials from the riots. I mean, I looked online, I looked through um, universities, through other, um, uh, uh, like, like the Los Angeles branch, the GLBT, and uh, no one had anything on it. So, um, so I have to thank him for a lot of the materials in that film coming from him. Also, um, Jane Cleland, okay, right? Okay, I haven't. I just met Jane briefly uh, about a year ago. She contributed several of the photographs um, uh, in this piece, uh, especially the, the one of the glass shattering that close up of the guy um, breaking open the front doors at the beginning. So anyway, that's it's kind of a roundabout way how I made this thing, but um, it's it's a it's such a surprise to be a part of a living history panel when it took so long for me to find any history on this at all. <laughs> I never would have predicted that. Um, so it's an honor to be here. Hey, I should add that the film that Steve made is his first uh, film, first feature film ever. And it's, it's won a major prize and it's scheduled to show at the Louvre and at the Tate Modern and at the National Gallery in Washington. So Steve has uh, launched his career as a filmmaker in a quite impressive way. Thanks. Uh, one other thing I just realized I should probably point out. Um, it, it, it was interesting in the process of making my feature, um, seeing some of the other ripple effects that... Um, or, or rather, how more people can find out about the riot and the events that sparked it through a piece of music uh, like Bob's. Um, the film I shot was filmed in about 10 countries, and I was amazed that actually the majority of those countries had copies of the CD in the most random, out-of-the-way places. It's out there. So that the voices, it struck me that the voices of the people took part in the riot wouldn't just be heard here. I mean, they're being heard elsewhere in the most surprising parts of the planet. 
In fact, I remember walking into a, a very conservative classical music store in the Central Square in Prague. They sold nothing but Beethoven and Chopin and stuff. And then there was a copy of All the Rage just right in the middle. <laughs> An activist planted it there or something, but uh, there it was. So that was interesting. Uh, it was, you know, I met professors in different parts of the world, various universities who are teaching some of Bob's pieces in their coursework, and all the rage is a major part of that. So people are learning about um, what happened at this riot. And um, I'm trying to think from living in Anyway, there's been a ripple effect, and it's kind of incredible. That, that something that happened so quickly and that there's so little documentation of actually found a way to spread. Thank you. Well, and uh, as is mentioned, um, particularly by, well, by a number of the speakers here, uh, you know, this is 20 years ago, and I think a lot of the memories and the stories fade um, as our comrades uh, die, as we forget, as we get older. And so one of the things that both the Historical Society and, and the folks here are part of trying to do is keep some of those stories alive and to document them and keep them going. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to the audience. I know a number of you in the audience were there that night, and I'm wondering if anyone in the audience would like to share a story or two. Yes. Uh, my name is Eric Trary, and that's actually me. Uh, I'm a little older now. <laughs> but um, I had uh, I had moved to San Francisco. Um, I had spent about a year here in the early '80s, and then I went back to Southern California. But I had just moved to the Bay Area, to San Francisco, to go to UC Berkeley. And I was very involved with ACT UP in LA, Queer Nation in LA, um, Clinic Defense Alliance in LA. I did a lot of organizing um, on campus at the junior college and San Monica College, where I went to before I transferred to Cal. And um, I knew Gerard, uh, I knew Bob Smith, um, and I kind of heard about this through the grapevine and uh, I just put on one of my old Act Up t-shirts and, and a jacket, <laughs> grabbed a, a sign, and I think for me personally, um, you mentioned it, and that's the exact same word that came to my mind. It was a sense of betrayal. Um, they, they were very tumultuous times, um, with war and all the other things, as you said. There was a, a, a kind of a, a seething anger in a lot of us for the way the government neglected the AIDS crisis in this country, um, and how it waged war in Central America, just the corruptness. Um, and then, even though I wouldn't have voted for Pete Wilson, the fact that he was elected and beat Feinstein in that race. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah by, <laughs> by like half a percentage point. Um, he had promised that he would sign a bill that, as long as it was limited to employment and housing discrimination. And, uh, and then, you know, for me, in my mind, when I heard people talking about, well, if there is a veto and we're going to riot, I was thinking, well, that's probably not likely because the guy said he was, he was going to sign this bill. And so for me, I mean, you know, I was, I was a little younger and maybe a little bit more naive, a little less jaded, but for me it was, it was a deep sense of betrayal and, and anger. Yeah. Um, and I was right there at the windows, I didn't break anything, um, but uh, I saw a lot of people I knew breaking things and, and I was cheering them on um, because it was a way of expressing that anger that was built up inside and, and it was really a deep sense of betrayal. Great, thank you. Hey, Dennis. Yeah, Dennis Tompkin. Um, I was a reporter for the Bay Area Reporter at the time, and I, I covered the, uh, the, the riot. Um, that was the year that the San Francisco Senate embraced Wilson uh, for governor. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, or, other, or other good newspaper. What, what was going on at the time was, look, our, our friends were dying, people were dying, there's no... There's no response to age, there's any, any use. We're all, dealing, we're all in a dealing with the epidemic. 
we're dealing with Christian right, we're dealing with all that. And then the governor had the fucking nerve to, to be told, be told he went on. It was a fucking gratuitous insult. It was a real insult to the community. It was a political cheap shot. And I think people were just fucking disgusted with it. Because there was no reason he had to do it. There was, you know, for absolutely no reason he did it. It was just a mean spirited thing that he did. It was, it was pure politics. And I think people realized that they just felt really betrayed and over it. That night, um, what I remember was it could have gone two ways. When I think it was down Van Ness Street and it stopped, and then Eric's rhetoric was like, take the state building, take, go to the state building, express your, express your sentiments to the state building. And everybody went to the state building. And then it was all, at, at one point the police backed off the whole street between, um, let's see, what's that? Holy Game between uh, Larkin, and, and, uh, Larkin and Hyde. Yeah. It was totally, uh, totally empty of police. They were on the side, they were on the, they were watching from the sides, and they couldn't do anything. And that's when we saw people, uh, well-known activists, uh, who were not here tonight, uh, pick up barricades and, and jam them through the, uh, jam them through the windows. And that's when a, a man named Alan Kalbrowski, who I believe was later arrested for it, um, torched, through a torch, a lit newspaper into the, commu the computer room, at mm -hmm. the, uh, which was the room that had had its windows broken, and it went up in flames, mm -hmm. and that was the first one. And that's when the ML Tala went around and started doing the recording. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. So anyway, yeah. Yes. Hi, my name is Woody Noah Harris. Uh, for me, I had just moved to San Francisco, and I was very active in New York City um, with ACT UP and Queer Nation, and so it was, uh, like Ingrid spoke of, you know, very much of the mindset, you know, that you know, we just took action. It, this was nothing new in terms of our response. Um, but to your point about, you know, why this night, um, the word betrayal has been used, and as was just mentioned, it, it was, this was, it was critical mass, it was the last try. I remember feeling, because I, I lived above Walgreens at the time, like right here at 18th and Castro, you know, like, anytime those flyers went out, I mean, we were like hot off the presses, we, you know, we just got them. And, um... You know, it sprays, it like literally would spread up the block. Like if you could take an aerial view, you could just sort of watch the news, you know, just <laughs> spread like up Castro Street and then, you know, branch out. And, uh, you know, for me, it, it was the same sort of sense, like the, the notion I have, the, the visual memory I have it is much more up close as opposed to like a crowd, uh, you know, sense of it. Because I remember exactly, I was in front of the window at that computer room, you know, with glass... And, and, you know, the, the fire going and stuff like that. And it was the first and I hope only time that I heard someone say to me, dude, your shirt's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> because I did not know that's how close, you know, yeah. I, that, you know the shit was happening. And, and my rage, my anger was just so, you know, palpable. I, it, not, like, I didn't even notice that I was on fire. I mean, it wasn't a you know, big fire. But, um, you know, to be that Wait. focused on, you know, Directing my anger, you know, elsewhere to not notice, you know, you know, something like that, um, and it was, it just seemed, uh, you know, we had been disappointed by a lot of stuff, we've been betrayed by a lot of stuff, but I think for me personally, in my mind, it was the idea that one man, like, how dare he? You know, the people had spoken in in the limited scope that it was, but the people had spoken, and this fucking dude who promised us, you know, that he would sign it. You know, said it was just the last note for me, and I, and I think for a lot of people. And we just, I knew that this was going to happen when we got there. Like, it just, you know, we were, because we were clever lot, you know, when we decided not to go to the new building and go to the old building. Because we just, they, they thought they knew us, and we were just always a step ahead of the game. And I just, you know, the, the, the feeling in the crowd was palpable, and we knew shit was just going to jump off, and... Um, I, I have since moved back to New York six years ago and was thrilled to be able to be here tonight, you know, when I heard that this was happening. It, it's, uh, it just takes me back to a time in my life that, you know, I, I don't know how we did it with all the, without Facebook and the, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but we did, you know. Jane, you're next. Hi, I'm Jane Hall. I'm a writer. I'm an Well, I think Gerard probably knows a little bit more about this than I do, but I know the one thing that sort of set the tone for the evening was, wasn't this the night that Frank George lost his shoe? Yes! 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 So, and I think that that was, that was mainly thanks to Peggy Sue. I don't know, I was at that Yeah, yeah, I was on stage when he lost his shoe. Thank you, Sue, for that. 
that. So as part of the no speakers, Frank Jordan, who was running for mayor, uh, showed up because he thought he could get a warm reception and he would be like, <laughs> 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 And, and who was Frank Jordan for those who aren't here? He had previously been the chief of police and then and then he was right. for, for uh, right for mayor. mayor. So so anyway, he was chased down the street to the degree that um, he lost his shoe. <laughs> he was literally running and uh, and you know, I don't think he was really running for his life, but he was probably running from some bruises and he lost his shoe and he just kept going. So that it ended up with the shoe, everyone was waving the shoe. There was probably more than one shoe that was held up. Was one, it was the actual shoe, but you know, we have Frank Jordan shoe. And, and it sort of was like, it was like, to me, it was like, a, you know, the, this golden ox or something that we could wear. We have the shoe! <laughs> but, um, you know, I don't know why. I mean, I know the Queer Nation had been doing a lot of a lot of stuff around AB 101 right along, and I can remember Angie Fa. Was Angie Fa? She was such a like. Uh, Angie Fa was a dyke activist who did a lot of union stuff, and she eventually ran for the school board and was on the school board for a while. But um, she had done a huge amount of organizing around this. I remember she had signature cards, thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of signature cards that. She and other people had collected about this, you know, to pass it. And there was a very widespread support that this thing should pass. And um, uh, so, and another thing that I think contributed to the sort of, um, you know, muscular response is. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing clinic defense. I mean, clinic the Bay Area, Bay 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 Core, Bay Core, Bay Area Coalition. 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 Bay Area in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Mm -hmm. And we have been in the clinics with clinic defense shields, literal shield, and um, practicing lifting clients over uh, sitting sitting in a Christian right anti-abortion activist. And so there weren't people there because they wanted a chance to yell. They were, the focus and the intention, I remember standing at the front door, and this guy had pulled a street sign in the parking lot, I don't know what it was, out of the ground. And he had it up on his shoulder as a barricade. I'm mean, not as a barricade basher, as a battering ram. Right. And it, well, because it was heavy, right? He balanced it half and half, which means each time he lunged the back, there's a danger of taking off people's heads. And, then <laughs> and um... I said to him, you know, I tapped him on the shoulder. I didn't know what kind of response I was going to get. I was this guy with this huge weapon on his shoulder. How's he going to react? But I just had to say, dude, watch the backswing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was like, oh, thank you for calling that to my attention. <laughs> questions what the queer rights movement owes to the reproductive rights movement, among other things, was the training that many of us yeah. got.
probably have a few more stories from folks here that I'm eager to hear, but I also have another question. Why was this the last time we set the state building on fire? <laughs> right, so the Governor Schwarzenegger vetoed same-sex marriage twice, and we didn't riot. The people of California voted against same-sex marriage, and we didn't riot. The courts have made numerous decisions in favor and against. So not that employment non-discrimination is the same as same-sex marriage, but they probably occupy a fairly similar level of sort of attention for the mainstream LGBT movement. Um, so why haven't we rioted since, and does it have anything to do with the fact that, you know, there's an Occupy San Francisco demo this evening and people are getting arrested inside of bank lobbies, and is there a connection? But you Can I just throw in, and that, this, the Vito riot was the last queer riot in the United States, in the world, as far as we can tell. So, worldwide, no one has decided to ride as a queer community since then. Although so the question goes a little broader. But it's worth pointing out that Los Angeles kept it up for two weeks. Yes. Yeah. After, after we did in our state building, they like blocked runway traffic at LAX and all sorts of things. So LA was... Uh, concentration of Republicans. So a lot of money that went into Pete Wilson's campaign came from Southern California and Southern California queers. So um, I guess they felt more betrayed. <laughs> to write, so. All right, so you in the back and then Scott. Yes. You, um, yep, you had one. I am a Stardust at the time, uh, also known as a Will Doherty at the time. Um, I was at that riot, but I also remember, just to, you know, I didn't live in the Castro, I didn't hear about it directly from the Castro, I think this was way bigger than the Castro, and I remember, uh, in addition to going to this, I remember going to an event at Stanford, where yeah. Peter yes. Pete Wilson was speaking, does anybody remember, that was after it was like the next day, the next day, yeah. and someone threw an orange at him, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> We had like a block, a, a people blockade around the area. There were people inside. There were people yelling continuously while he was giving his speech. And when he was getting out of there, he was really hightailing it out of there. They had a limo that was driving across the grounds of the campus, not on the not on the streets. And they almost hit like ten different uh, protesters on the way out. So it wasn't it wasn't something that was just a cast of thing. It was way 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 beyond. And it was wonderful to participate. <laughs> Thank you. Scott and then Greta. Are we still reminiscing or are we talking about? We're like, reminiscing. Like, like, <laughs> tell us what you want to tell us. I will now, so I reserve the right to reminisce and ramble on. Um, basically, <laughs> it's my impression, because I don't have like concrete memories, but I remember getting up to the, on the Golden on the street, Golden Gate, and just seeing this police barricade go in and out, in and out of the door. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it started rotating, and at that moment, my brain went up, oh, ladder. And am I wrong in remembering that there were actually people who went up the ladders and were in the yes. office? Yes, yes. Yeah. 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 All right. But then, well, the other one thing we're not talking about as well was the pepper spray afterwards. Yes. And I remember Peggy Sue and the late great Jason Bishop come running at me like, pepper spray, pepper spray. But they didn't get hit, but a couple other people did. And we ran into that Star's Fancy Schmancy restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and we walked in there, was a bunch of freaks and, and, and these actors queers, and there's pepper spray smell everywhere. And the main of is like, can I help you? <laughs> they actually did. They went and got like you know pictures of water to wash people's eyes out with. All the while, these like you know you know highbrow people are having their, their uh, dinners. They're <laughs> 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 like, uh, yeah, not even a block away from this riot that's going on. And they're having their you know their fancy dinners, and they're not aware of what's going on outside. Now, to speak what you were talking about before, Laura, is that I mean after the problem eight thing passed. Uh, here and I, a bunch of us were out in the streets and walking the streets, and we were seriously like, "Come on, let's walk in the middle of the street." Like, oh no, 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 we don't want to do that. We don't want to be useful. And we're at Dolores Park, and we, myself and one other person sits down in the middle of Dolores, and everyone's like, "Oh, get out of the road, get out of the road. You're confusing people. These people may have voted for us." I'm like, "I don't give a shit. They may have voted for us. It failed." So it's, there just doesn't seem to be any sense of urgency anymore with it. It's basically they've got 
kind of enough of what they think they wanted, that there's no need to push for anymore. They didn't live through the times that we did. You know, right. I said, we're going to back in the day. <laughs> um, you know, because we were fighting for our lives back then. In combination with, I just hear a bird back then, and so I was angry about that, I was angry about AIDS, I was angry about Pete Wilson, I was angry about pretty much everything back in the time. And it was about my life as well. Yeah, I was going to mention, I, I was one of the people that went up the ladder. Oh, you were the one! Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, well, there was quite a few of us, actually. I remember someone standing in the office doing something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and what I was going to say about it is, if the building didn't burn to the ground, it wasn't for lack of trying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the people who went into the office were doing their darndest to, to set everything on fire that they possibly could. You know, it's a modern concrete and steel. It wasn't actually, it was pretty hard to set that thing on fire. <laughs> 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 so they say. Yeah, there was every intention to burn that thing to the ground. And Is it was the one? Not while I, at a certain point, I was like, okay, I've got enough sound. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, if the cops come busting in here, they're going to come busting into a room full of people trying to set the building on fire. And I'm ready to climb back down the ladder myself. So, um, I don't know if this one is I'm pretty sure they did, because I remember looking through the police reports that um, Gerard had contributed to the, the files in the archives. And, uh, I don't think they want it right away, though. No, I, I mean, I don't know when they happened, but it looked like it was just in specific kind of isolated rooms, but it, it was clear. I mean, the police reports confirm what you just said, I think. Is that the police trying report to signed by Lee Miltello? Because that's a lie. Yes. <laughs> 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 I also wanted to speak to why we go right and now, and, and, and frankly, uh, uh, you know, to just speak my mind, frankly, uh, I don't think the LGBT community is very angry, you know? and uh, uh, we're more upper class, we're more established, and we're, um, and frankly, uh, I think much of the more, much of the sector of the community that thinks in a more radical way isn't particularly motivated by the whole issue of gay marriage. Yeah. You know, and I, I realize that people have different opinions about this. I wrote a call, I have a blog on the Huffington Post, and I wrote a call sort of outlining my lack of residence in the issue. You know, I got all this for it, but, but you know, you see it, and I think we're going to see it in uh, the current mayoral election. Right? Like, the LGBT vote, you can't assume is progressive. No. Good point. All right, so that set off a whole bunch of hands. I still had, <laughs> I had the guy in the back in the glasses, the, the boy over here, the pin, um, Brian, the sister in the back, and then Wade. So that's my list. All right, Greta. Um, well, I wanted to speak to the question of, you know, why was this night different from all the nights? And it was just <laughs> <laughs> um, 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 And I was struck by something that Lido said that I hadn't known until tonight, which is that the people, a lot of people who were doing the, you know, the property destruction, um, weren't, you know, the act up types, quote unquote. You know, that it was, you know, the the Democratic Club people. And um, I was I was there that night. I didn't participate in the riots, I participated in the demonstration, and when I could tell that it was getting ugly, I was like do I want to riot? No, I don't think so. Um, but I was somebody who was very much on the periphery of the street activist movement. You know, I had friends who were involved in it, and I sometimes went to demonstrations and sometimes didn't. And I think that there were a lot of people who were there last that night who were like that, people who didn't traditionally go to demonstrations. And it was huge. It was like Jane was saying, there's usually a couple hundred people at this thing, and this was thousands. And I think that, that partly there's just this mass of, you know, this sort of massive anger multiplied by 20 because there were more of us, um, but also a lot of people who weren't as familiar or maybe jaded, you know, with, you know, activism and who were therefore more easily set off to, to cross that boundary. That's, that's just my speculation. Um, but, I, but I had known that about, that, that, the, that it was the people who were actually doing the property damage 
weren't the people who usually turn out for demonstrations, and I think that's very telling. Um, you know, as to why we don't write anymore, I mean, I'll sort of echo what other people are saying, although in a different way. I mean, I think that a lot of the Brick community, we've had enough victories. You know, we've had enough successes. I mean, we still clearly have a huge way to go, and there's still horrible things happening. But I think that we don't feel as just uniformly, constantly crushed by the boot of mainstream society. I think we feel much more integrated in society and much more part of it. And so when bad things happen to us, our reaction isn't, oh God, again, you know, for the 40th time, for fuck's sake. Um, it's more like, okay, well, this is a loss, but we had a bunch of other wins earlier this year, and, you know, we're, you know, the, the long arc is moving in our direction, and so I don't think that there's that sense of rage. It's more, you know, it's like frustration and a sense of, okay, we need to keep hammering at this. Okay, thank you. And the gentleman in the back. Uh, yeah. Just to the uh, Prop 8 uh, point from a few years ago, it's worth remembering that that night was a night of very conflicted emotion for a lot of people because many of the folks who were uh, happy uh, that Prop 8 passed, who were actively opposed to it, were also that night wanting to celebrate the election of Obama. Yeah. Okay. So before, people realized how much you'd sell out to the corporate world. But, that's not <laughs> it. but at, at that moment in history, people were really out to yeah. celebrate his election. And it was you know, the same night, the same election. and. So there was a lot of conflict there. I also think, you know, at the time of Prop 8 passing, people weren't dying anymore. Uh, 20 years ago, there were a lot of folks dying, and I think that fuels rage and yes. anger, and perhaps the rage and anger of ACT UP is what spilled over and, you know, became rage and anger in uh, this particular riot and so forth, but by 2008, the numbers in the game community in San Francisco value were drastically low. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, on the, on the point of like why we don't riot, I think, I think people are still dying. I think it is really important, but I think the community has Thank become you. divided. I Thank think you. like... You know, the trans community, which is a community that I'm a part of, has a lot of people that are dying every day. And I think that a lot of people got really super comfortable because, you know, they could get jobs, they could get money, they could be in relationships. You know, especially being somebody who doesn't live here, who comes and visits here, San Francisco is so lucky. You know what I mean? Like, being able to walk around the Castro and see, like, couples together making out, I'm just like, oh my fucking God. But there is still so many kids that are just like unhappy and not okay. And I really wish there was more, you know, like community where everyone worried about these things and everyone wanted to riot when another kid kills himself or another kid gets beaten because they don't look the way they should look and the way that it's impossible to get employment, health care, to go and see a doctor, to be in relationships, anything. Um, the other part of why people don't riot is you know, it's getting fucking scary. Like, I was in London supporting my partner doing like the ed education cut stuff. We got peddled in for 11 and a half hours in the middle of winter with no food, no water, no doctors, no toilets, no nothing. You know, they basically smashed us into submission to where I don't ever want to demonstrate ever again. You know, like I definitely had PTSD after that. So that's, you know, two reasons. Thank you, thank you. And I think it's worth picking up on the piece, particularly about the transgender community and the extent to which the broader and more sort of mainstream LGB community sees transgender issues as part of, of, of our calling, of our community, and of and our campaigns. And I think that the fact that, you know, the ENDA that was put forward eventually um, or at first did not include gender identity as a protected category, and I think that is a very sort of telling indictment of our willingness to throw parts of our community under the bus um, in a pretty shameful way. So hopefully as we move forward, we'll pull all of ourselves together. Uh, Brian. Yes, I'm in Sacramento. I was knocked up for two years, I mean, 88 to 89. Uh, there was the last one I was in, big one, 100,000 against the Iraq war. We looked at that crowd and we thought, oh my God, how have we grown? The paper said it was a huge escalation. 
We did it. There was no police car burning. I can't remember that that was someone I know. But, and then it stopped. And then everyone ignored it. It was a very it was a huge, hopeful rally of extremely peaceful people that was just ignored. And I, I, I imagine that goes into it. The other point I wanted to make, oh, I work with the transgender community in Sacramento. And we ha I always want to make this point. This is San Francisco. There's other places, and many times the transgender community, uh, especially the FDM community, uh, which is, you know, I'd say, hey, I work with FDM people, and they're like, oh, with the guys in dresses? I'm like, oh, they're way. And I'm talking about people in San Francisco who can't get that <laughs> in their mind. But this, in like Sacramento and other places, can be a very conventional uh, community. And then, kind of my last point was that uh, many of these what do you call it, nice gay organizations. I, I've seen them up close, work for them. I know them up in Sacramento, there's a lot of them, that's the whole thing. Uh, they tend to like control a lot. They don't like transparency. Uh, 80 to 90% of the people in the actual town, be it lesbians, that see them as completely irrelevant. ACT UP is completely different. ACT UP is completely attuned to, I guess you call it the street. Um, and so also like, their VIP relationships with the uh, elected officials and such, and city officials, is very important to them. They get a crowds of maybe 40 or 60 that are, on another scary point, all women, maybe one or two guys, I, maybe a few other people, but mostly older lesbians um, who are very conventional. And it seems like the Sacramento culture is very important. So we are in a very troubled time, I guess, is my point. And I, my question, I guess, to people would be, how do we get from there to what we're talking about now? Um, where people quote Lady Gaga as, as a big activist and say, Harvey Milton. <laughs> 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 so. All right, the sister and maid and then the woman. So I just want to say good evening, everyone. I'm Sister Maid Joy, be with you. And thank you so much for being here tonight. I was there 20 years ago. And I was within an arm's length of the very first brick and stone that got tossed. And um, if I learned anything at all that night about politicians, is that Pete Wilson taught me I could never trust a politician with my queer rights. And, and how did we do it? We did things then, 20 years ago, by calling 15 people. We started at 1.30 in the afternoon and we called 15 of our friends. They called 20 of their friends. They called 30 of their friends. And we talked to one another. And if I've seen anything since Prop 8 is we are fragmented. We have 18 agencies that want to do the same thing. 20 years ago, it was all about us. And we were there as a community in a response. And I think that we have lost our ability to communicate through spoken word, to, um, to take the time to really talk about the differences. And um, it's not as simple as just um, typing something in and then just sending it and walking away. So I think it's our fragmentation, or maybe it's our strength in diversifying even further, but that, that would be my academic response to um, maybe how things have changed. Thank you. Thank you. Wait. Um, my name is Wade Palmer. I was at the, well, everybody, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess the three things I want to point out is that that night, we had a history behind us from 1989 where we had peacefully demonstrated and been beaten down by the police just two years earlier. So the organizers of this evening had that in their brain, that we were not going to be victims of the police again or ever. And there was a feeling, at least it seemed to me, that there was a level of empowerment that we were going to try and respond in ways that were not necessarily within our usual nonviolent established parameters. But it wasn't, I think it was organic. For me at least it seemed organic. I mean allegedly, when things got fire. Because <laughs> I don't know the limitations, and I don't know who's cops here. So, I, I, honestly, I, I feel like it didn't seem to me like people were like, this is the plan. What happened was, each step of the way, as people became empowered by watching the powers that be step away from us, 
that we were able to then move in directions we had moved before. And it really started with this belief with the core group of organizers of, of ACT UP and Crit Nation that we weren't going to be victims as we were October 6, 89, when they beat us within an inch of our lives. And right prior to that, a standing mayoral candidate, former police chief, campaigning in our own neighborhood, attacked by us, chased by us, yeah. saved <laughs> by us, <laughs> crying like a little <laughs> scared kid <laughs> into his car. Such a nice feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and then holding the holy shoe. Uh, uh, you know, those, I think, are really important aspects to like the fertile ground that then happened. I do believe that most people didn't come intending to do anything. They came to express their anger. The anger was ignited. Gasoline got added along each step, so to speak. And um, <laughs> <laughs> allegedly, um, my leather jacket still has a big burn mark from a police car that went up somehow. And <laughs> but why we're not doing it now? I mean, honestly, because I, I I was living in LA. We organized in LA after Prop 8. Forty small activist groups cropped up immediately after Prop 8 with people who were younger and really ready to get involved and do all these things and kept repeating the same thing over and over with little uh, cohesion or willingness to work with each other. Uh, I think older activists can speak to the point of where egos get involved and no one really speaks to each other. They just think that they're going to have to be right. And we don't have an urgency in the same way that we did before. We are, we are a multi-dimensional community now. We don't have just one issue, we have hundreds of issues. Mm -hmm. But we also have very limited leadership beyond the checkbook writing community. And until we see an activist group willing to start putting themselves into the street again and speaking what the people have to say versus what we're told to say, I, I don't think we're going to have it right anytime soon. But I really want to thank you guys for being on the on the panel and, and saying the truth. And it was an honor being arrested with you. <laughs> and I do want to say, you know, there's a lot that's been going on in just the last week of people being militant, doing direct action, and getting arrested. And I, you know, both in, um, starting in New York with the Occupy Wall Street, and today Occupy San Francisco took over a number of banks and people got arrested. So there are, including one person who was going to come here because AB 101 was the first big action that he went to and he couldn't come here because he was getting arrested in the oh. Chase Bank lobby. I know. I was like, that is a good experience. Yeah. 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 So, the woman in the striped shirt. Hi, my name is Meredith Blastine and I came here tonight because I was actually living in New York when this all happened here. And I remember hearing about it, and people were like, wow, in San Francisco? Because I guess New York's um, image of San Francisco was that things just did not happen like that here. So um, people were like really excited that it did happen here. Um, and to answer you, maybe this is simplifying as to why things don't happen like they did back then. Um, I feel that we actually had this Un unapologetic fierceness to everything that we did. And I feel that, I mean, maybe this is oversimplifying, but I feel that the class differences that exist in the outer community at large that we all live in is no different within our community. And that a lot of people have become very complacent because they're very comfortable right now um, in, in set, being semi mainstreamed. Um, it just seems like there's a really big focus of people adopting kids and having kids, and I don't know, it just, it, it's a very different community that I came out in in the early 70s. Yeah. And I still, I work in healthcare, I see a lot of people that are still sick with AIDS um, on a daily basis, and 
people think that it's, you know, it, it's, it's not there anymore. And I think somebody else was saying this. It's still alive and well, and people are still getting sick. So that's not over. And also, I think because we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have computers, there was a lot more face-to-face -face contact yeah. that people had. That's yeah. not somebody or send an email to somebody or you can even send an email to someone's phone. I mean, we actually had to meet and congregate. And it was it was very, very, you know, I mean because all of you can attest to it was very, it was a very, very difficult. Right. We're coming to a close in our time, so I wanted to ask Gerard if you have any comments. You've been thinking about this a lot in putting this together. No, my only comment is that I knew that the panel would have great stories I hadn't heard, and I knew that half the panel would be the rest of the people. <laughs> and hearing all these stories is just so fantastic. Uh, we're talking about, well, we need to get together and talk. It's one of the things that the museum has offered us, is a place to come and talk, to share these stories with each other, and to share them with a generation that wasn't here at the time, or with people who weren't here at the time. It's so empowering for me to see the ways that our history can be used. Uh, it's not a dusty textbook. It's a tool we can use to shape the present and the future. And I think this event is a real, a real indication of that. So I hope all of you will help support the Museum of Historical Society. It's on Thank you. Thank you. And Thinking about the extent to which you know our history won't tell itself, and if we don't collect these stories, if we don't have the the GLBT Historical Society in this museum, and people like Gerard convincing us to drag out our old T-shirts out of our attic yeah. um, and bring them in, that we won't we won't remember our history, and that the people who come after us won't know that history. And um, I think it's worth saving. Uh, I'm a member of the Gay and Lesbian Historical Society. Uh, I encourage you, this is the fundraising pitch, um, <laughs> to uh, you know, consider how you can support um, the Historical Society in keeping our memories alive and the memories of the people that we've lost um, and keeping this history as uh, present and vibrant as it is here. And so whether that's donating your old papers and t-shirts or volunteering or becoming a member, um, I'm starting to sound like the KQED pledge break. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It just ended too, right? Anyway, talk to Gerard, talk to the lovely folks at the front desk, and thank you so much for coming out, and um, thank you for writing. Thank you.